to the mic, they start dimming the lights, you start feeling alright From Birmingham, home with the Teddy Longs, and the room is studded More once you discover, for all of the lovers, Whitney Houston and Roman Reigns For all of the lovers, and Mickey James and Marvin Gaye For all of the lovers, and Sasha Banks, Janelle Monae, Silk, Sonic, and Paige Allow me to say, look, I just found a place, we escape every one of us I was kinda late, so I just made it off the struggle bus Walking by the fake, cause I know it's right in front of us Yo, I ain't with the hate, gotta focus on what's great Ladies and gentlemen, Steph Hardy is on the air Had to drop a couple bars just to make you all aware So, sit back, relax, enjoy the show You know I go by Joe or the rest of the flow Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl Stephanie Hardy. So on this episode, this bonus episode, I have your news and gossipish, and I have a special interview with the Russian Dynamite, Masha Slamovich, and I have what I liked and didn't like in wrestling this week. So sit back, relax, and listen to the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. So, in your news and gossipish, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in wrestling for this week. So, we're going to start with the news of Big E discussing when he found out about his WWE Championship win and when he was booked to get it um to get it started. So, of course, as you know, Big E was Mr. Money in the Bank and he cashed in his um Money in the Bank contract a few Mondays ago to become the WWE Champion and defeating Bobby Lashley on Monday Night Raw. And he went on the Oral Sessions podcast with Renee Paquette, a.k.a. Renee Young, um, and discussed precisely when he found out he would be winning. He basically pulled a Babe Ruth and called his shot on Twitter early in the afternoon, which sent everybody, including myself, into a frenzy. Because, of course, usually whenever people say, oh, I'm going to do this when it comes to the money in the bank, um, it usually doesn't work to their advantage right because john cena had done that before so we were thinking okay he's gonna call his shot now but then it's gonna wind up messing up and he's not gonna do it and for like the first few minutes of that match when he cashed in it looked like it was kind of bleak but he turned it around and he wound up winning so big e said on the show um oral sessions that while the wheels were set in motion when he tweeted that he would be cashing in later that same night he wasn't 100 percent counting on winning the title until it happened he's quoted as saying we did the show in new york and i was driving from new york to dc and then i just got a call that my travel and everything was adjusted so i was like okay i'm going to raw but it wasn't until monday afternoon pretty much right after i sent the tweet that it was like all right all systems are go and this is what we're doing so pretty much from then on it feels like my life changed because everything has been so much more hectic i had a bunch of people reach out and do interviews that monday it's like all right we have to do these interviews monday afternoon i was like nothing's been done yet i just sent out a tweet but things were already in motion you know how it is in our industry you don't really know until it happens so i always kept waiting for some sort of swerve or a segment to run too long or something to happen where i'd have to backpedal or maybe even lose the briefcase i don't want this to sound arrogant but a part of me did but a larger part of me thought there's no way this is going to happen because people would lose their minds people would be upset that's not good heat that's not compelling oh let me watch this that's like already that's like all right you've let me down once more heat now of course he went through with it and he wound up winning um the wwe title and also retaining on monday night raw in a match versus bobby lashley who was hell bent on getting um his rematch for the title because he was mad at the way he lost but um biggie went on to beat him on monday night raw in a steel cage match and he is um drafted to monday night raw seeing as the draft was um this was basically tonight friday so um 
it's pretty clear that WWE has full on intentions of keeping him, you know, on top for a long period of time um, as the WWE champion. And I'm just really happy that he's in this space where he can fully enjoy and bask in um, the glory, no pun intended, um, of being a champion. And now he can go on to face, you know, newer people on Monday Night Raw. So again, congratulations to Big E for that. Also in the news, we have the announcement of AEW's um, John Huber Legacy Foundation. So um, AEW released a statement on September the 29th, basically um, the same day that they were having AEW Dynamite in Rochester, New York, which was the hometown of Brody Lee, who sadly passed away last year. Um, they, they released a statement talking about John Huber's um, Legacy Foundation that was started by his wife, Amanda Huber, and his brother. So in the statement, it says, on the same day All Elite Wrestling, AEW makes its debut in John Huber's hometown of Rochester, New York, his family and friends are announcing the creation of the John Huber Legacy Foundation. The foundation will focus on providing support to people in creative fields who have not taken the next step in their career because of family obligations. John almost gave up on his dream of wrestling because of his family, said Amanda Huber. But he got the call to move up to WWE while we were in the hospital with our first child. I can't think of a better way of honoring his commitment to family and his career than to help other people who are facing the same dilemma. Beginning in 2022, the foundation will select a group of creative individuals to support with resources, connections, practical skills, and direct funding. The cohort will meet throughout the year to learn from experts in areas including business planning, artist management, public relations, brand management, finances, and IP law. These skills and connections will help them provide for their families while also helping them pursue their dreams. Many artists and wrestlers are never taught how to manage their finances, investments, and assets in a way to make sure their family is secure, said Chris Huber. Like our father, John always wanted to make sure he was making decisions that were the right decision, not only for his career, but also for his family. The foundation will announce its first application round in early 2022. And for more information, please visit www.johnhuberlegacyfoundation.org and or email at the um, email address that they have listed. So this is a beautiful way to honor the legacy of John Huber, a.k.a. Brody Lee, in the sense that he there were so many people who when he passed away who talked about how passionate he was about his family how much he loved his wife amanda and how he was all about his two boys and i think this is a beautiful way to honor you know that legacy of him loving his career but not only you know loving his career but also loving his career and his family at the same time because i can't tell you how many stories i've heard from either from Pete from older wrestling fans where they talk about you know how hard it is on the family when the, when the man um has a wrestling career and they rarely if ever see him you know if that's a father or if that's a husband or in the case of women as well so the idea that this is actually going to help wrestlers of the future you know plan everything in order to keep their family secure in terms of money and also um just help them sort of balance everything out it's just absolutely wonderful and in the name of Brody who is just an amazing human being it's just great and we can and um the Hardy Wrestling Podcast continues to send blessings and healing energy towards the Huber family as they um navigate life through the absence of Brody Lee and also the AEW family as well also in the news we have Eric Bischoff talking about when Bray Wyatt should make his debut in AEW if that's really a thing. So, um, earlier this month, Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, um, which has sort of been going through the struggle um, as of the last few months, or basically the last year and a half, um, they, he reported that the Rochester show that AEW was supposed to have um, had been discussed as the possible time and place for Bray Wyatt to debut should the promotion sign him um, given um, Brody Lee was from Rochester 
And there were also lots of rumors spreading or lots of, I guess you could say, fantasy booking of him taking charge of the Dark Order in the absence of Brody Lee, who he loved and all of the above. But no one, Bray Wyatt has never, hasn't really said anything or alluded so much to the fact that he would sign with AEW, um, except for that one post that WWE made where Seth Rollins was talking to Stone Cold in the Stone Cold sessions, where he was talking about um, their infamous Hell, Hell in a Cell match and how he was frustrated about it. And then Bray Wyatt tweeted and said, you know, I can't wait to tell the story either, but Um, you know outside of that nothing has truly been confirmed from him since he's been um released from wwe but um after that basically in order for bray wyatt to have signed with AEW, um wwe would have had to have waived the standard 90-day non-compete clause um since wyatt was released in late july but eric bischoff said um on his 83 weeks podcast that it would be the wrong move on AEW's part based on all the huge debuts the company has had recently so he's quoted as saying let's just assume bray wyatt is just is going to end up in AEW. i wouldn't do that debut until after the first of january i'd say for that i'd save that for the first quarter of next year because they've had so many signings and they're great ones too Um, I'm not being critical or dismissing them in any form. You got Sting, you got Christian Cage, CM Punk, Brian Danielson, Ruby Soho, etc. These are super talented assets. They've brought in so many great assets over such a short period of time. They tend to dilute each other and it's not meaningful as it could be in my opinion if they were spaced out a little more. That's why if I was bringing in Bray Wyatt, if I was Tony Khan, the AEW president, I'd lay off the surprises and chatter about who's coming in and not coming in and more for the audience. It's like a roller coaster and we've been on this incredible, exciting roller coaster ride. And the only way you're going to enjoy the next big exhilaration point on that roller coaster is to get a little bit of rest. Now, he's right because... When it comes to AEW, they have basically shifted the landscape of wrestling as we know it by having so many amazing signings, you know, with Adam Cole, with CM Punk, who um, is back in wrestling after seven after a seven year absence. And then you also have um, Brian Danielson, who made the jump from WWE to AEW, along with Adam Cole and Ruby Soho. And it's just with all these people who have, you know, made all these, you know, moves to AEW you know we need a minute to catch our breath because it felt like a lot of especially Adam Cole and Brian Danielson that was like in the same night and we just need a minute to just kind of breathe and just catch our breath so if they are going so if Bray Wyatt is gonna go to AEW which I wouldn't mind if he does um yeah I guess saving it till maybe to the end of December till maybe January wouldn't hurt um But yeah, and then you have someone like Eric Bischoff saying this because he's, you know, he's Mr. Controversy creates cash and he basically helps WCW successfully beat WWF a long time ago. So he kind of knows what he's talking about here, but we'll have to see. But, you know, as long as Bray Wyatt is at a place where he's happy, then then that's all that matters. Also in the news, we have... um, Ruby Soho talking about her AEW experience so far. Um, She sort of talked a whole lot about her special moment at All Out where she um, was set to go, where she basically um, felt like that was the most spectacular moment in her career. Um, This was where she made her debut and she was the Joker in the Casino Battle Royal match. And she said, there had been a lot of anticipation building up to that on my end and being worried that I may not be accepted in this new place and that people will maybe disappointed if I was the Joker or anything like that were a lot of things that were in my mind. But when they started to chant Ruby Soho before I even came out, it was an overwhelming feeling of gratitude and excitement. I stepped on the stage and immediately felt like I was home. I felt accepted and I had never been so excited about the future of my professional wrestling career. Now, of course, Ruby went on to win the Casino Battle Royale, which gave her an opportunity to face Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, for the AEW Women's World Championship. Um, she cashed in on the opportunity and fought her at Dynamite Grand Slam, 
but she came up short sadly but you know she wound up making a lasting impact here um and afterwards she said it's surreal i've only been here for a few weeks and i've already accomplished these incredible milestones and been so honored to to be in these huge moments that are a part of the company's history now i feel like i've accomplished so much even though i didn't walk away as the champion on dynamite i feel like i've accomplished so much in such a short period and i can't wait to see what else this place brings and what else i can be a part of i'm just so excited about the future and then she talked about um having hist a lot of history with the women there and how she's known them for quite some time She's quoted as saying, as far as people that I haven't gotten a chance to step in a ring with, one of the people I noticed right off the bat is Nyla Rose. Her presence in the ring is just astounding to me. When she's around, she makes her presence known and she has carried herself incredibly well. I am super impressed by the work that she's done here in AEW. She's definitely somebody I would love to step into the ring with. And she also mentioned Serena D by saying, that she's followed her the majority of her career she's somebody that i've looked up to quite a bit um and she and she also mentioned that she is highly impressed um with ty with tynara conti and how she's just continued to be impressive impressed by her and she's also said that she notices that aew is different and the reason why it's different is because they have such incredible fans that um, that is in the on the roster and they are the most authentic version of themselves and she talked about how that energy is just kind of infectious because they're at the happiest that they've ever been or at their peak so it's nice to see that ruby soho is in a happy place um and i just cannot wait to see what else the future has for her um, even though it may not be her time now to be the AEW Women's World's Champion, I'm pretty sure one day she actually will be. Um, so I'm just really looking forward to what the future holds for Ruby Soho. And I love her theme song too. So shout out to Rancid. Um, <laughs> also in the news, we have Alexa Bliss um, slated to take some time off. According to Wrestling Inc.'s Raj Geary, um, Alexa Bliss will be off WWE programming for a few months before returning. Now, if you watched Extreme Rules this past Sunday, she had a pretty great match against Charlotte Flair for the Raw Women's Championship in which she came up short in her hometown, I might add. And on top of that, Charlotte wound up ripping up Lily, the voodoo doll that she had made friends with, you know, since her and Bray Wyatt were together. And she tore it up. But then after she tore up Lily... Alexa Bliss was, you know, distraught, like super distraught, like crying and foaming at the mouth and everything. And it was just kind of hard to watch her, you know, just cry and act like that and everything over the doll. And then I assumed that on Monday Night Raw that maybe she would get some revenge, like evil dark revenge on Charlotte Flair. But then Charlotte Flair came out there, you know, and beat up on Dewdrop and Eva Marie and then after that point that was it so Alexa Bliss didn't show up again so no one knows exactly what she's going to be doing you know when she comes back especially we actually don't even know where she's going to be back considering the draft is going on and that's going to continue on Monday so we don't know exactly where she's going or who or what persona she's going to have but if this is going to be sort of like the end of the Alexa Bliss persona which a lot of people are predicting that it is on social media then it would have been a great turn for her because I feel like you have to be really talented to go from being you know a pixie happy person to an evil valet person to basically a mean girl champion you know for as, as long as she was to a whole new character with Bray Wyatt and sort of being his you know muse or whatever and you know just doing all that I, I that's very admirable like she's just a really great performer in that way so if you know Voodoo Alexa is gone then I'll be a little bit sad about that but it's okay but whatever she chooses to do I'm pretty sure it'll be cool maybe she'll be taking time off to plan her wedding I don't know you know so she is engaged so we'll see what happens but you know it's okay um and lastly in the news i just wanted to take this time to put over the impact wrestling knockouts having their knockouts knockdown tournament where 
a lot of the impact knockouts talent we're gonna are gonna be facing women from all around the world in a one night tournament on saturday october the 9th on impact plus so if you have impact plus you can watch it there so um that's gonna be on that's gonna be streaming on saturday october the 9th at 8 p.m eastern on impact plus and youtube for impact ultimate insiders so impact hall of famer and first ever knockouts champion gail kim announced that this special one night tournament will feature four impact wrestling knockouts facing off against four of the top women's competitors from around the world and whoever is victorious in this tournament will receive a future knockout championship match now as it stands now um in the future of course there is this match that's supposed to be happening between mickey james and diana parazzo who is basically quite possibly close or if not already the longest reigning knockouts champion you know and she has an iron grip on that thing so depending on whoever wins this tournament they're going to be facing either diana or maybe mickey i don't know but it was also announced that um, mercedes martinez is going to be the first entrant in the um tournament she's making her impact debut and it was also announced that the second entry is going to be lady frost um who is known as the coolest professional wrestler you'll ever meet and Renee Michelle announced that she will be she is the third entrant in the knockouts knockdown tournament as well so basically some of the best in women's wrestling you know all around are going to be in this thing and it's really exciting so if you are a supporter of women's wrestling please check that out and just invest into the future of women's wrestling outside of the big big really big promotions <laughs> and that's all for news and gossip ish and now we're going to go to our special conversation well my special conversation with masha slamovich all right you guys we are here on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with the Russian Dynamite and Russian Dynamite badass, Masha Slamovich. How are you, ma'am? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. So I'm really glad that you're here because ever since I met you at um, the NWA Empower Weekend, I just had, like, I just had it in my mind that I just had to have you on the show because I just loved your performance. So I'm just really happy that you're here. Well, thank you for that. And I'm glad to be here. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to start by asking you, when did you fall in love with wrestling? When I was a little kid, like pretty young. Okay. So you you were just knew like right then that that was what you wanted to do? Pretty much. You know, I just remember watching SmackDown. I remember that that was the show. And... You know, within like 10 minutes, I was like, yep, this is it. This is what I'm meant to do. <laughs> okay, cool. So it was just sort of, it feels like almost like it was a love at first sight thing. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty accurate and that's cool. So I totally get it. Like the first time you see it, it's just instant sometimes. So um, when did you know that you specifically like want to go after it as a career? Then when I was a kid, you know, <clears throat> I remember like all the kids around me were like, I want to be a doctor or like a firefighter. And that all just seemed so mundane and boring to me. And I just knew that wrestling was so much greater than that. And that's what I wanted to do. And plus I would travel the world. So that was a big uh, catch part of it. Yeah, that's kind of like, the, I feel like that's probably like the best part of being a part of wrestling is the fact that you get to go so many different places. So I feel like that's definitely like a, a cool benefit of that. You get to travel the world and beat people's faces in. <laughs> well, that is one of, uh, one of, in my opinion, the best perks of wrestling, yes. Yeah, definitely. So were there any obstacles that you have to, did you have, that you had to face as you were becoming an athlete and as you were training to become a wrestler? I just, you know, put it in my mind that I was gonna do whatever it took so I just shut my mouth and opened my eyes and my ears and I just did what I was told to do so you know it was pretty straightforward just put the effort in and here we are okay so who exactly trained you if you don't mind going into that 
So I was originally trained by Johnny Rods in Brooklyn, New York, uh, in a school, the world of unpredictable wrestling. Okay. So what was the greatest lesson that you learned um, during that time? Uh, I, that the basics are the most important things, you know, your fundamentals. Um, the, the, like when you have that nailed down that everything else will essentially be smooth sailing. And, you know, I guess don't think, just do. So that was, that's something that I have always carried in my mind and I teach to all my students too. You know, that takes a lot of bravery to sort of push yourself, you know, to that limit because there's so much that wrestlers do. And even with you, do, like when you were performing in NWA in the Women's Invitational Cup, there was a whole lot of like high flying moves and jumping that you were doing that I thought was just so impressive. And it's just that takes a lot of bravery for anybody to be able to do like to just because there are some people who just are afraid of heights, period, like and just don't want to like get high at all. But then it's just like, there's people like you and so many different wrestlers who live and thrive off of high fly or like jumping off of different things. So it's just, there's, I feel like it takes a lot of bravery to do. And it's really clear that you have that in, in like millions and billions in your soul. So that's amazing. Well, the, the bravery I, I do have in my soul, but it is funny that you would assume that I'm not scared of heights. I hate going on the top rope. I I do all of that high flying stuff in the in the moment. I'll just decide that I'm gonna do it and I can't get it out of my mind. I'm like, well, I've just gotta do it now. So there we go. <clears throat> yeah, like I wasn't necessarily like assuming that you weren't necessarily afraid of heights, but I'm just like in my mind, it's like whenever I see any wrestler jumping or doing stuff like that, like I just wonder if they have fear or if they don't have fear because seemingly on the outside looking in you know they'll just boom and just do it but then in my mind I just sort of wonder like so were they just did they really just think about it or did they just but yeah um it's okay though because you're in a you're in a safe place so it's okay if you're afraid of heights though so it's cool it's um that's another lesson that I learned at, uh, at Johnny Rods uh, is that fear gets you hurt so the second you start doubting yourself and fearing, that's when things go wrong. So if you're going to do something, just commit. And like I said, don't think, just do, just go for it. Hope for the best. Yeah, that's a that's a really great life lesson to have in just anything as well. So you just got to do it. So um, what was, I want to ask you now, one of the coolest things I did see about you during that weekend was um, your character. So what was the inspiration behind that? It's me. There is no character. It is just me being myself amplified and I do what I want. So that's the story. Okay. So um, as you're building your fan base, like as you've been sort of, you know, matriculating through the independence and everything, do you feel like you've sort of built a strong fan base? I, I do think so. I have a very loyal fan base who always support me and they have been supporting me for a while now. And then, you know, of course there's people uh, who are joining in, of course, but there's definitely, a, you know, a good handful of people who I can name who've been here for at least several years on the journey with me. Okay. So to sort of switch gears a little bit, um, I wanted to ask you, because since I've started my podcast and I have been talking to wrestlers, they've sort of been talking about like different ways in which the pandemic and all of the world's events has been sort of um, affecting their careers. So um, how exactly did you um, fight your way through that? Um, well, I was lucky enough to if you can call it lucky, uh, I do. I got uh, stuck in Japan because I was there on what was supposed to be a three month tour and which turned into a year long uh, stay there. And wow. I was I was honestly lucky enough to only be like out of action for about a month. And then we started doing tapings in the dojo, which we live streamed to our audience. And by July, we were back in front of a live crowd at shows. So I was very lucky, but even with all of that, you know, there was so many big events and, you know, like once in a lifetime chances for matches that got taken away from me. 
and it was you know really difficult to continuously not know if the next show is going to be there or if you know any everything was so uncertain at the time so that was something that we always had to fight through and like you know like quarantine and things like that so but I think everything happens for a reason and if anything the pandemic made people like myself and others come out of it stronger because we never let it keep us down we fought all the way through and now we reap the benefits of the efforts we put in Yes, now that's something that I definitely am um, glad that I do, that I am hearing is the fact that so many companies found and so many wrestlers found so many different ways um, to sort of push through and still put themselves out there, um, even with when it comes to just their work, their character work out there, and even their businesses out there, and even with their promotions, it's like they found different ways to sort of go around the situation. So I think that that's one of the most inspiring things that have that has probably come out of this crazy time it's just the fact that people have found different ways of doing things you know outside of what they're used to and it allows for people to sort of adapt to new things so it's good to know that you were able to have those moments you know in Japan where you got where you're able to get yourself you know to a good place and work hard and reap the benefits of that uh, yes I I do consider myself lucky and like you said, so many others uh, showed their resiliency and that's exactly what you have to have in this business. You have to either adapt or die. Yeah, definitely. So who has been your favorite opponent to face so far? Um, I would give it, a, a, let's say one in Japan and one in America. I'll give you the, the best of that. Honestly, I've had a really, really good matches with Diana Perazzo uh, in the States and in Japan, it would definitely have to be Chihiro Hashimoto. Okay. So do you have any dream opponents? Yes. Uh, one of the matches that was unfortunately uh, taken away from, you know, the, uh, both of us actually <clears throat> during the pandemic, uh, there was supposed to be myself versus Meiko Satomura. Ooh. And that match will hopefully one day take place. I believe it will. Oh, I hope so. Cause she's actually one of my favorites. I love her. So I feel she's like- Incredible. And yeah. uh, we were both trained uh, by Chigusa Nagayo. So it's it, it was really, that was a really awesome match waiting to happen. Yeah, like I really hope that does happen. I'm gonna keep a lookout on your socials and stuff to see, you know, if that ever does happen, like I wanna see it. Like I will make whatever efforts I have to to watch that one because that's a, that just sounds cool. Um, so you did mention earlier that you are also a trainer yourself. So what is it like, you know, sort of being a trainer and basically fostering um, the growth of different of other um, wrestlers who are just, you know, starting? And it's one of my most favorite and rewarding experiences. Uh, especially because two of my current students were also my students in the last school that I coached at and they followed me to the new school. So I have been training with them uh, again since the moment I got back uh, in January. And just to see the progress and to see, you know, the learning, to see it all click and come together and to see the way that wrestling inspires people and it, and it makes people feel is really beautiful and to know that I'm helping train the next generation of wrestlers. Now, I'm not a teacher, but, <laughs> and I'm not a wrestler myself, but I'm just a fan who's sort of finding her way in sort of in the professional landscape of it all, because I'm just a, a wrestling talker. But I know that the first time I commentated this year, and one of the most inspiring things I did see was seeing wrestlers who had just started out. And there was this one woman, her name is Kaylina Keen. Um, she's from Buffalo and she started out. And I believe when the event that I was commentating for, she said that that was like her third match, like ever. And I remember just feeling so emotional that day. Cause I was just like, man, like there are people out here in this, in this wrestling world that aren't necessarily like veterans like these are people who are just there are people who are have only been wrestling for maybe three years maybe five years or people who are really just started like maybe a year ago and they're finding their way and it is just the most beautiful thing because you can see their love and their passion for it and it's just so palpable so 
I know that if it felt palpable to me and I just met her that day, I can only imagine how it feels for you being a trainer and actually having a hand, you know, in that growth. It's, it's really awesome. And like I said, it's, you know, rewarding. We all put the hard work in together and, you know, I believe in being harsh and stern, but it's for your own benefit. And once you finally, you know, start getting it and it all clicks, well, then we all start reaping the benefits together. And it's one of my favorite things to see uh, growth and evolution and to see the light bulb go off in people's minds. Definitely. So speaking of, you know, it's so funny you said evolution. Um, it's just, when I think about, you know, you and when I first saw you, which was at the <laughs> most, which was at NWA's Empower, which is a historic event, um, in women's wrestling and basically professional wrestling as a whole. Um, it's just, you were there with so many great women, you know, in the Indies and also from on a really high professional level as well. Um, and then you, it was produced by Mickey James and so many different, you know, women who are just great in this business. How did it feel to get that call, you know, to be a part of something like that? Like, what did that feel like? It was another really cool moment in my career because, you know, I didn't go searching for the opportunity um, and Mickey James had reached out to me about it. And I was really excited because I had wanted to work for the NWA for years. Um, you know, because of their history and it's so rich and interesting. And now to be a part of that history is one of my personal uh, greatest accomplishments in my opinion. Um, and, you know, just being there was, it was really incredible and it was an emotional night and it was just art in my opinion. You are just as right as you can be. Like wrestling is art. It's so funny you said that because I was watching a video earlier this morning where somebody was describing wrestling as art. They were comparing, weirdly enough, they were comparing hip hop music to wrestling. And he was talking about how wrestling basically is an art. And I was, and it's so cool that you said that because I feel like a lot of people have this mindset towards it that they feel like it's either, which is, I, which I think is an insult. It's like they either call it fake or they feel like it's not an art. But in my mind, I feel like, you know, it is. So it's just, so honestly, I feel like Empower really was, you know, a beautiful artistic, you know, beautiful moment for women's wrestling as a whole. And just to see so many women like you and like Sahara Seven and Renee Michelle and so many different women being a part of that and Tootie Lynn, who I had on the show a few weeks ago, um, be a part of something like that. Just, it was just a beautiful thing. And I'm so proud of all of you. Thank you. And I do agree that it was a really, uh, it was an incredible experience to share that locker room and that stage with all of the women, uh, like you named Tara Seven, Ray Michelle, and many others who were there that night, you know, Chelsea Green, Layla Hirsch, I can go on and on. Yeah, definitely. So as a women's wrestler, have you ever heard or has anybody ever brought any misconceptions or disrespect towards women's wrestling to you and how were and how were you able to um, push past that in your own career? Well, I go out and I prove people wrong. I don't believe in these verbal arguments about, you know, is women's wrestling good, this, that. Wonderful. Have that conversation after you watch one of my matches because what frequently ends up happening, and I take great pride in this, is that there are people who have misconceptions about women's wrestling and even especially intergender wrestling. And they'll have watched one of my matches and they'll DM me and they'll say, you know, you changed my mind about this. I like it now, you made it believable. Whatever you wanna say, I make people like it. I make people care. I had to make people turn their heads to women's wrestling and to intergender wrestling. And that is one of my personal favorite things that I can bring to professional wrestling, in my opinion. And I take honor in that very much. Yeah, that's something that I greatly respect. So, I mean, I know sometimes when it comes to even intergender wrestling, a lot of people be like, uh, but, or they kind of just drift away from it because it might make them uncomfortable. But there are just some people, there are a lot, a lot of wrestlers who, women's wrestlers who feel comfortable with that and they don't care. So, you know. 
that's that's exactly uh one of my opinions because sometimes fans will start speaking up and saying hey that you shouldn't have done that or start getting into their own opinions of oh was it right to do that well you know what it's not your goddamn place to have an opinion on what i will be doing in a professional wrestling ring unless you're a wrestler enjoy it from the other side of the guardrail exactly very strong feelings and i appreciate that so um if ever given the opportunity would you sign with a mainstream company well you guys are just gonna have to keep an eye on what's going on for that question to answer itself (laughs) that's a good answer i i respect that so how exactly do you feel about the state of wrestling as a whole um and what do you think could be better and what do you think is good that's happening First of all, I think wrestling is absolutely on fire right now. Uh, You know, all it takes is for you to take a look at what happened at the last AEW. Uh, The kind of matches that we saw for for you to tell me a year ago or two years ago that that was going to be taking place. I would have told you to stop stop taking any drugs or taking because that is insanity. (laughs) And 2021 is completely unpredictable. I mean there's things that we couldn't even dream of that are taking place right now and i think going into 2022 we're just going to continue to have our minds blown by professional wrestling you know everything's intertwined all the doors are open and you never know what the possibilities are yeah definitely i i feel like that's one of the best parts about it is like there's so much happening at a time that as a fan it sort of makes your head explode <laughs> because there's just so much so much good stuff all around um, so it's just, there's always something new to see every other week or something new, like every other day sometimes. It's just an ever evolving thing this year. Like, I, it's almost like because last year everything was just so, so tame. It's like this year, but I was like, all right, it's time to go balls to the wall. And they did everything. <laughs> As it should be. It is, it is absolutely beautiful to see this boom or renaissance or whatever you want to call it of professional wrestling and independent wrestling and all wrestling around the world. You know, you asked me what the negatives are. I can sit here and bitch and moan about things that are wrong, but why, why do that when we can focus on all the positives because the amount of good things going on in wrestling right now definitely outweigh the negatives. Definitely, and I agree. I definitely agree with that. So outside of wrestling, what are some of your um, favorite hobbies or other things that you like to do? Well, I am definitely an avid athlete, so I enjoy running and weightlifting, but you know, that kind of goes into training for wrestling. Uh, So I suppose my hobbies would be more training in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I'm learning to play the drums. So that's what's, that's what I've got my time being consumed with when it's not professional wrestling. I wish I had time to learn how to play the drums. Like, oh my gosh. Like if I had more time to learn how to play that type of, that that instrument, I would be so happy. It's it's really, it's really awesome. And uh, hey man, maybe we'll see you in a band one day. <laughs> oh, I definitely feel like you would, you would definitely fit in a band. Like that would be really cool. You never know what the future holds, right? You really don't. <laughs> you really don't. So, who are your top five wrestlers, whether they be male, female, or non-binary? Oh, it's really hard to narrow it down to just five. <laughs> I suppose we'll go with, uh, is this still recording? Okay, we'll go with uh, Dynamite Kid, Chris Benoit, Misawa Mitsuharu, Kenta, and let's throw Muda in there, because who doesn't love Muda? Yeah, that's a pretty solid and diverse top five there, so I can appreciate that. Definitely, it's a pretty good one. So I did see that you have been featured on AEW Dark a couple of times um, against the likes of Hikaru Shida and Penelope Ford. Um, what was that experience like and how did you, and how exactly did you get the call to participate in that? Both of the times that I were there were lovely experiences. And like you said, I wrestled both Penelope Ford and Hikaru Shida respectively which uh, I had a great time in both of those matches and uh, I had wanted to work Hikaru Shida for quite some time. So I'm happy that I got to take place in 2021. Um, 
As regards for how I got the call, the first call, the first time for the the match against Penelope Ford, I found out like two days in advance. And I wasn't even in my home state. I was in Philadelphia training at uh, Cheeseburgers or see, what, what, Cheeseburger, right? I'm like, how do you change this <laughs> name? I don't know his new name. Um, I was at a school and I just saw the email. And I was like, man, I got to get home tomorrow back to New York and then drive all the way to Pittsburgh. But I mean, as you can see, I made it happen, right? Yeah, definitely. I feel like even in the times where we did, you know, speak to each other, you did, you do make a lot of stuff happen. And it seems like you're a very wanted woman. So and I see why like, it's you're perfect. So definitely, like, I was really proud that you had that op opportunity on AW Dark. And I was just really excited too, because I was just like, Oh, my God, I know her. So yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And uh, I do try to keep myself quite busy and I am very work oriented. So that's how I spend most of my days is trying to continue the successful climb. Yeah, um, I also saw some breaking some other news that came out, I believe it was um, towards the end of last week, where um, there was a report that maybe AEW might be adding a secondary women's title. Um, would that be something that you would be interested in going after in the future? I'd be interested in going after every woman's title and every non-woman's title as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what does the future hold for you, Masha? Well, we're all going to have to find out together because I say this in every interview. If you would have asked me last year to tell you all, the, all of this stuff was going to happen, you know, it's completely unbelievable. I would have never been able to assume that these things would take place and for me to even have any imagination of what's going to take place in the next 12 months is quite frankly unrealistic because I whatever plans I have wrestling may have different plans and I just don't know where this road's going to lead but I'm going to continue doing what I do best which is professional wrestling and I'm going to enjoy the journey because sometimes the journey is more beautiful than the destination and sometimes there's not just one destination either. You are right about that. That is such a, a poignant end to an interview because I can relate to that on a very deep level because I never thought that I would be doing this either. Like last year, like if you had told me I'd be doing this and talking to people like you um, in NWA and so many, you know, and meeting so many amazing women in wrestling. Like if you told me that like in January of last year, I would have looked at you like you're crazy. Like, come on, stop. Um, so you do have to enjoy the journey and where it takes you because you just never know where everything can take you. Like it, it can be like a crazy what if episode. You just never know. Life is fun. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. So you can take this time to tell everybody where they can follow you on your social media handles and tell everybody what you got going on. Well, you guys can all follow me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Masha Slamovich. And for all of my upcoming shows and exclusive releases and all the random stuff I put out, join me on my Patreon, which is also Masha Slamovich, um, for all of the awesome content there. And if you're interested in t-shirts, there is Pro Wrestling Tees forward slash Masha Slamovich as well. Thank you so much for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. Right, so in this segment, I'm going to talk about the things I liked in wrestling this week, along with a mixture of the things that I may or may not have liked in wrestling this week, as opposed to doing like a full on recap of all of the different shows. Because for Monday Night Raw, there was only so few clips I saw until I went to sleep because I was really tired and I worked. Um, so yeah, so with Monday Night Raw, I liked the idea 
that the Hurt Business seemed to be reforming even in the absence of MVP who is currently injured. Like I'm really happy that that is happening. And I really feel that this that one of the worst things that happened this year in wrestling was them breaking up in the first place. So the fact that they reformed to sort of serve as allies to Bobby Lashley who was angry that he lost his WWE Championship to um, Big E. And then of course the New Day was behind him, you know, and having his back as I always do and being by his side even as Adam Pierce scheduled for Big E and Bobby Lashley to fight in a sealed cage match at the very end um was really cool too and just seeing them you know collectively have each other's backs and everything even though Bobby Lashley is clearly a heel and that's well defined um it was still good to see all of that black excellence in one um full sitting and I was really happy that Big E um retain the title because something that did kind of scare me is that I saw enough of Raw to know that I know that Goldberg made a whole um promo talking about how he was going to come back and exact revenge on Bobby Lashley for hurting his son um which he has every right to do because yo like you really put your hands on my son um and I was thinking oh my god what if Bobby Lashley wins the title back and then he fights Goldberg and then Goldberg wants to fight him for the title and then um, at Crown Jewel and then he wound up losing to Goldberg and I was really scared half the time but I was still glad that Big E um, retained that they're actually going full throttle on a push for him as opposed to just you know slapping it on Bobby just so Goldberg could have something to take from him because Goldberg's time you know as a champion has truly passed um so yeah that's one thing um, that I did like was the fact that Bobby and Goldberg are going to fight without championship implications and without um, ruining Biggie's momentum as a champion. And, you know, the fact that Biggie has officially been um, drafted to Raw um, makes it a lot better, too. But I'm also wondering how that's going to go with the New Day, considering the New Day, um, Kobe and Xavier have been drafted to SmackDown and they've separated the New Day yet again. Um, in a less dramatic fashion, but yet in still a very horrible fashion to which everybody reacted to tonight on SmackDown. And it was just kind of sad. So, um, so does this mean Biggie is just going to fight on his own without any allies? Like, or does this mean he's going to cross over or what? There's a lot of questions going on with this draft and, um, I'll probably get into it a little bit more later, but that was something a few things that I liked about Raw. I think one more thing that I did like about Raw was the fact that um, um, Dewdrop had a little bit of a moment versus Charlotte Flair, but she wound up retaining her title anyway. So, but then the the best thing about it was the fact that Shayna Baszler is now coming out and injuring women just for the sake of injuring women. And it's almost like she's developed this character where she's sort of, you know, feeling bad about it because the first person she did this to was Nia Jax. Um, and it seems like she felt guilty about, you know, injuring these women and breaking their arms on the steel steps, but then she's still going through with it. Like, it's like, she's a remorseful, abusive person. And it's just so weird, but I love it. So I don't know if she's going to do this to all the women, but I hope she doesn't do this to Bianca Belair, who is now officially on the raw brand, um, as of, well after crown jewel but as of tonight she's announced as a draft pick on raw so yeah like i just like creatively most of most of the stuff that they're doing with the women i actually kind of like so i'm not necessarily mad at any of that so that's pretty much all the stuff that i liked um on raw and i also well one more thing that i really like is the fact that um humberto carrillo and angel garza are now an official tag team and I feel like that was like a no brainer to me when because when they first announced that those two were cousins, I was like, oh, well, why don't they get together? That was like maybe two years ago. And now it's 2021 and now they're actually a tag team. And I feel like it's probably the most personality that I've seen Humberto Carrillo have in like a long time. So hopefully this will work for him because he's really talented and he just deserves, you know, to have more of a personality. And maybe Angel Garza can bring that out of him. And I'm just glad that, um... Angel has something to do because he's super talented as well. He was somebody that I pegged or a lot of people pegged that could have been the next Eddie Guerrero. Um, but all of that kind of just got pushed to the side ever since Andrade left and so many other changes happened. So yeah, um, that's pretty much all I like to happen on Raw. And then on NXT 2.0, 
which has been either rubbing people the wrong way or people have been liking it is the fact that it was a very female driven show even though the commercials that they were showing for this episode of NXT 2.0 were a little bit on the kind of not overtly sexual but just kind of like on a va va voom side more than NXT's women's division has been in the past and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing because you know NXT's women's division is probably one of the well was or basically technically is one of the best divisions that you know exists in terms of women's wrestling on the planet so it would kind of be weird for all of that to kind of just be thrown away or push it aside all because they're trying to appeal to um I guess a more younger or hipper demographic or whatever by trying to sort of kind of sexualize them but not sexualize them to the point like in, in the divas era but um yeah that part was a little bit weird and I give a shout out to TK Trinidad for actually mentioning that um but I did mention um that they're probably doing that because Mandy's new faction with JC Jane and um Gigi Dolan is called Toxic Attraction and a lot of something and a lot of what they're doing is kind of like you know hot but crazy kind of thing going on so and it's working for them but at the same time I don't know if that's healthy I'm not sure if that's great for the health of women's wrestling as a whole for right now um so I don't know it's a little bit weird and especially since they're it looks like they're positioning Mandy Rose to be next in line to face Raquel Gonzalez for the title but I just don't know how that's gonna go and even though Mandy Rose has gotten better you know with her wrestling skills since she's gone to NXT um and stuff it's just like I mean this might be good for her because she's never had a solo title before so this might be a good step in the right direction for her but I just don't realistically see how she would beat someone like Raquel but we just have to wait and see I guess um and then another thing that I like that happened on NXT was the fact that they were showing um Index's honeymoon and you can tell they're really really in love with each other and they're just having a good time while Johnny Gargano and Candice are following them and it's just kind of weird like why are you following them they need to have their privacy as a married couple um chill out and it's just really funny you know they're just I feel like Johnny and Candice are basically just being the parents that they're going to be in the future because <laughs> Candice LeRae is pregnant in real life so I feel like they're going to be probably really excellent parents but I doubt very seriously that they'll be like the type of overbearing parents or helicopter parents there we go um that they are playing on television but I still think it's funny so yeah um and I also like the Lash Legend show lashing out um Lash Legend she looks like like she was dressed in an outfit that I feel like would definitely like it channeled Megan Thee Stallion and I'm pretty sure at some point maybe she will fight um but at the same time her as a talk show host was pretty cool and I actually liked that so I'm actually looking forward to seeing that a whole lot more and I liked how a lot of people online were, ta were taking pictures from her um show and actually placing themselves in it like jobber tears did shout out to them and I was just like bruh like I cannot tell you how happy I would be if she actually did talk about you guys like that would be really funny and she was sort of talking about you know how the draft was coming up and different you know events going on and just different like gossip and stuff that's happening you know in NXT which is essentially what I do but you know what a lot of us do but it was really cool and it was tastefully done so I'm excited to see what the future holds for Lash Legend um and I loved how Trick Williams got into the face of that tag team and I forgot the tag team's names but they were like they kind of look like you know country like they're country boys and um when they came out and they were talking mess at Trick Williams, at Trick and Carmelo Hayes and at MSK, um, Trick didn't take too kindly to that. And he said, man, if y'all don't get y'all a little 
I think something along the lines of Mamby Pamby and um, Cotton Eye Joe Head ass. <laughs> if you don't get your Cotton Eye Cotton Eye Joe Head ass on, like I I can't be hood. I'm sorry, but <laughs> but that but I thought that was so funny because it's just like just sound like you know a very contemporary insult, and it was just really funny. Like and plus I just really like looking at Carmelo Hayes and Trick. Um, Williams but more specifically just trick because Carmelo is cool you know once he gets his style going and everything you know he you know he's looking a lot better but trick though he came on and he walked on with all that body yaddy yaddy and it was just like whoa and I think from now on I'm just gonna call Carmelo and um trick trick or treat that's basically their new tag team name so but I feel weird though because it's like Carmelo has the opportunity to go after any title that he wants to but it was almost like he was giving off the impression that he would use his opportunity that he won in the breakout tournament to go after the tag titles and I'm just looking like bro like you you could literally go after the NXT title or the NXT North American title oh um especially now since Hit Row is supposed to be going to Smackdown because they've been drafted so I mean I don't know like it's weird but you know the tag team division in NXT is pretty cool so yeah that's pretty much I think that's basically all I liked about NXT 2.0 considering the fact that while I was watching it I was also going through a um technical difficulty so I was kind of in and out with it but you know the technical difficulty got handled so um that's about it for NXT 2.0 that I really liked um in terms of AEW this past Wednesday the funniest thing was Arn Anderson talking reckless at Cody and then basically saying you know that that the reason why you know you couldn't get the job done you know with Malachi Black for disrespecting the Nightmare family and all that's because you know, you're the type of person who's, if somebody tried to rob you out of your car, you'll say, okay, I'm getting out of the car, you know, and you, you know, just say, leave me alone. And then they just, you know, he'd let them go with the car. And Arn Anderson said, I'm the type of dude that will take a Glock and put it up against the dude's forehead and splatter his brains all over the sidewalk. And I'm sitting here like, now Arn Anderson, I never knew you were the type of person that was just going to blast somebody like that and possibly kill them for trying to rob you of your car but now that I know that this is you I just don't know what to do (laughs) I just don't know what to do anymore it's you so I mean good oh god it was just a lot and then what's so funny is Cody and um Lee Johnson um were in a tag team match and they wound up winning but at the same time it was um and Lee wound up getting the pin but what irritated me about that was the fact that they were focused so much on it's like Tony Schiavone came in the ring you know and he was interviewing Arn Anderson and Cody and it felt like Lee was just in the background just kind of looking at everything going on after the match and I'm sitting here like why aren't you guys you know helping to sort of put him over because he's the one who got the pin and not Cody um it was just a little bit weird to me that they were you know letting that happen but I mean but then Arn basically told him, come on, come on, Lee, at least you listen to me, you know, because apparently Cody has been listening and everybody's just been booing Cody lately since I've since I've been more consistently watching AEW more often. It's pretty clear the audience does not like Cody Rhodes and it's so weird, but I kind of understand why, though, because they feel like he's just everything you know that they just don't like about the wrestling business where one person is just always the end all be all and stuff and they just kind of want him to just chill out which I understand but you know it's also his company too so maybe he should just take a step back and just be behind the scenes for like a long period of time and then figure out what's next I don't know but yeah something else that kind of intrigued me and disturbs me about AEW each week is the amount of lengths that MJF will go to to make somebody mad and be disrespectful and but I know one thing about him that I don't like in particular even though I know 
that he is a heel and he has to do everything to get under people's skin because he is a heel and he does that really well I just don't feel comfortable with the way that he gets physical with women like I really don't um abuse is something that I just do not respect at all from any point of view from a man doing it to a woman or another man or a woman doing it to a man or another woman like I just hate that and it's just the idea that MJF that one of the quirk one of the quirks about him as a heel is the fact that he gets to grab up on women like he grabbed Julia Hart's wrist and started you know hurting her and twisting it when she was out there being the moral support for Brian Pillman Jr. and then he even pushed he pushed the referee Aubrey Edwards during his match with Chris Jericho at all in all out all in all out all out but and I'm just sitting here like how is anybody just sitting here okay with it like it was disturbing me but yet I saw nobody talk about it I'm not sure if this may be his first or second time doing it or whatever but I just don't like it and it just makes me very uncomfortable I feel like there are ways to be a heel without you being disrespectful to women and being abusive to women like that's just gross and yeah it's just a problem and I just really wish that they would stop it because it, it's just it's just giving it's giving misogyny and toxic masculinity and everything else that's bad um and I just don't like it but he got into Darby Allen's face and mentioned the death of his uncle and how he was in a car with him and that made me so sad because I'm just sitting here like you're really mentioning this right now that's so terrible like that's just really really terrible um but Darby was like you I'm you're not gonna get in my head like that and all of that but MJF is just he's just a very ruthless person hmm yeah and also something that I liked in AEW with the women is just the fact that Ruby Riot, not Ruby Riot, Ruby Soho, 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 is, um, you know, getting back on the ladder and she's motivated to try to um, get back in the title picture once again because she lost her match in a very unfair fashion to Britt Baker, well, to Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, um, because of her X Factors Rebel and Jamie Hayter. Um, and I also like that, I also love the promo that um, Jay Cargill and Nyla Rose and Thunder Rosa were cutting on each other for that triple threat match that they had tonight um, at um, Rampage, which was pretty good. And I was really surprised that Jade cut, came out the winner, but you know, she's undefeated. So, you know, I mean, I'm not mad about that. So it's cool. But I was at, I actually want Thunder Rosa to sort of be like the next person to sort of challenge Britt Baker for the women's world's title because I feel like she should have been had a chance at that um and also in light of um another fellow Latin wrestler getting an opportunity I want Andrade to to win this ladder match that they've got coming up on the anniversary show I think so he can challenge Kenny Omega for the title because even though I understand that Brian Danielson, you know, did not lose his match against him at Grand Slam and it was a draw, I really need for Andrade to come after Kenny Omega for that AEW title. And the reason why is because, like, I really feel like Andrade should have won the Triple A championship from Kenny Omega, but then stuff got moved around and Kenny was the one who was booked to win. And that made me mad. So I'm just like, bro, like Andrade deserves to have his moment in the sun because he just has, he just, he just deserves more of a moment to show what he can do. And his match with Pac from weeks ago proved that he definitely does still have what it takes to be a champion if they just let him. And I'm just ready for him to do it. So yeah, like I'm getting more and more invested in AEW the more I watch it. And then CM Punk is just awesome. So I really don't have anything to say about him. I'm just no notes about him or no nothing. Like I'm just really excited to see what he, what else he does because he's there and I'm just happy he's there. So yeah, um, those are all my thoughts on AEW. 
and what I liked. And I'm also enjoying just the fact that AEW just has enjoyable theme songs for everyone and how they're all just really real, like full on real life songs (laughs) that you would probably hear on the radio anywhere. So that's really enjoyable. And the Jungle Boy theme song is really getting stuck in my head. Like it's, it's there. It's an earworm. So yeah. And as far as SmackDown goes, oh my God. This WWE draft has basically just turned everything upside down. And (laughs) I don't know. It's hard to tell if it's for the good or for the bad. But I will start by saying that I am absolutely thrilled at the idea that WWE officially announced that they have... Go, they're going to start their king of the ring tournament and then they're introducing a queen's crown tournament you know to be a companion to it and I am so pumped for that because it's like Xavier Woods has done nothing but talk about how he wants to be king of the ring like all year long and the fact that this is happening I feel like this is his chance like he really this is something that I feel like he's really wanted for so long and I and this is his opportunity he needs to be king of the ring there needs to be a face king of the ring and it needs to be him like seriously and I would say the person that I'm pushing to possibly two people that I'm pushing for to possibly win queen of the ring well three actually um not queen of the ring but the queen's crown tournament would either be Liv Morgan Naomi or Zelina Vega simply because of the fact that I just want to see Zelina Vega win something great and I feel like as a heel if they're gonna go with like another heel um I don't want to say another heel because this is their first time doing this what am I saying if they're gonna go with like a queen's crown person and someone who could embody that I feel like if given the chance Zelina Vega really could you know let that go and actually unleash you know, a part of a level to to her character that we have never seen. And that would just work for her. And it would definitely work for Naomi because, you know, she's trying to rise, you know, up the ranks and everything. And even though she's not in the title picture, you know, as of yet, um, and she's on SmackDown now, much to the chagrin of Sonya DeKaren, um, I feel like that would just be a good goal for her to try to reach for, um, to prove her worth, you know, as a really substantial women's wrestler that's still there and if Liv Morgan were to win you know that would be cool for her because she just deserves some type of reward for all the hard work that she's done over the past two years in order to improve as a wrestler you know and have a little bit of a singles run only to be put back into a tag team with Ruby Soho slash Ruby Riot at the time and then be kind of just by herself as the only person left from the Riot squad now um if those if either one of those three won I would be really happy but I'm really pushing for Zelina Vega to be the queen the first queen's crown winner so yeah I was really excited about that um official announcement like it's like all summer we have been talking about how we want WWE to do right by their women and give them more opportunities and this is one of them so I'm pumped um the draft however that was really crazy um Big E is officially on Raw now so that's okay But they separated the New Day again. The New Day, um, in terms of Kofi and Xavier, are now on SmackDown. Um, Bianca Belair is now on Raw, even though she's still sort of currently in this tag. um, Well, not tag. What am I saying? In this title picture um, with with Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks, who just made her return. And then they fought in the main event of SmackDown, but it felt like even though the match was really good it just felt like Becky even though it was meant to be that way it felt like they were taking all the attention off of those two girls in the ring and placing it all on Becky Lynch and then after the match ended and Sasha Banks took advantage of Bianca Belair being distracted by Becky Lynch Charlotte Flair came out there and basically beat up on everybody and she held up her Raw Women's title as Becky held up her SmackDown Women's title because Charlotte has been drafted to SmackDown even though she's the Raw Women's Champion and I'm just like so you basically just took the two women who gave you one of the most historic moments of the past five years um and easily a match of the year candidate in that WrestleMania main event it's like you took them and basically just scrapped them and had and treated them like they weren't important and to toss them aside all for the sake of propping up Becky and Charlotte 
the two, the main two white, the main two girls of the four horsewomen and mainly the two the two horsewomen who aren't of color and you basically tossed out your black women just to proposition them up as champions and you wonder why people get disengaged but either way that was that that was kind of distasteful to me like that that just sucked um it just seems like all the black women just have all everybody pressed it's like bianca and Sasha had Becky pressed Naomi had Sonia DeKaren pressed like and she was like I didn't pick her for Smackdown but she's drafted to Smackdown and I was just like girl what is your problem what is your problem and you need to go to a counselor and get it fixed miss ma'am because I'm tired of it she just stays speaking reckless on Naomi's name and it's just like Naomi told her it's like Naomi is actually way more accomplished than you and you're just trying to sit here and be disrespectful to her like it just gets on my last nerves like I just hate you and I cannot wait till the day you decide to stop being Miss Suit and go back to being you know Miss Hair Up Square Up person and and Naomi can actually beat your behind I just can't wait for it because everything that she that Sonya Deville is giving off she's just giving off like I'm jealous of this I'm, I'm jealous of her for whatever reason But then it's also giving off a story that many black women know about as if, you know, they're a black woman is just being policed heavily for being passionate and for being who the true essence of who she is. And because it threatens somebody else who doesn't understand it, they want to lose their mind and just be all like, oh, well, she's doing this and it's making me feel this way. So you're going to get arrested or you're going to get fined and all this other stuff. And it's just annoying. So I'm just ready for Naomi to beat her butt. Um, I'm also amazed at the idea of Montez Ford still being able to fight and do so many matches with injuries. And I just really hope that he's okay. Um, ultimately. And I was really excited to see the Street Profits and Kofi and Xavier team up against, um, the Dirty Dogs and Otis and Gable. Like that was just a team of black excellence all around. And it was just really cool to see them, you know, get that win. So... And then just the idea that Hit Row has been drafted to SmackDown, you know, like this opportunity is huge for them. And whoever was on Twitter talking mess about them and saying that um, their peak was only going to be at NXT or that, you know, they aren't ready and all this other mess, they can rise to the occasion. Don't be a hater all your life. Just chill and let them live. But yeah, congratulations to them. And Austin Theory has, has also been drafted to Raw, so I think that's pretty interesting um so his way stuff is now over and I'm wondering how they're gonna feel about that or if they're gonna address that on NXT at all but yeah we'll see so that's about it except now Drew well Drew McIntyre has actually been drafted to Smackdown um which is really different and Jeff Hardy's been drafted to Smackdown and in a stunning turn of events Brock Lesnar is a free agent, which means he can do whatever he wants to. And he thanked Paul Heyman for it. And Paul Heyman was looking distraught backstage with um, the bloodline. And I'm just sitting here like, and then after he left and after Roman reiterated to him that he needs to make sure that the Usos stay on SmackDown, Paul Heyman left. And then Roman told the Usos, look, I need you to follow him to Monday Night Raw to make sure He gets you guys to stay on SmackDown. And he said, if not, you leave him for dead on Monday. And I was like, oh my God. Like Roman Reigns just carried out a hit on Paul Heyman. And it was just the most gangster thing I had ever heard in my life. And I loved it. (laughs) So yeah, it's just lots of crazy stuff going on. And I'm pretty sure, you know, you'll get more draft results, you know, on social media. Because I know I didn't mention all of them. And then, of course, the draft is going to still keep going on on Monday. So, yep, they're shaking a lot of stuff up. So there's lots of good things happening and there's lots of pretty crazy things happening that a lot of people may or may not like. But um, through it all, I feel like everything's going to be okay. So, yeah, and that's pretty much everything I liked in wrestling or did not necessarily like in wrestling this week. (laughs) 
All right, so I want to take this time to thank Masha Slamovich for coming on my show. Um, the Russian Dynamite clearly has great stuff going on for her, and I just wish her nothing but the very best in her career going forward. Um, so please check her out on all of her platforms that she listed in the interview um, itself. But also, please under please um, just thank you for. <laughs> what was I trying to say thank you for listening to the hardy wrestling podcast and thank you for being supportive of my show as I continuously um chart what's going on in professional wrestling while also talking to um so many people who are passionate about this sport um and people who work in the sport and people who are fans of the sport as well um if there is any questions that you have about wrestling or any questions that you have you know involving any events or stuff like that you know feel free to drop in my dms or if you also just need somebody to just talk to um please just drop in my dms and just let me know um how i can help you in any way shape or form and i will try my level best to do that and be there for you in any way shape or form i can because aside from being a host and a commentator and a billion other things i'm a cool person so if you ever just want to just reach out and talk to someone if you feel like you're alone you know don't hesitate to reach out and stuff so you can follow um the hardy wrestling podcast on instagram at hardy wrestling podcast and on twitter at hardy wrestle pod and you can listen to this podcast anywhere you get podcasts um anchor spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, iheart radio even my youtube channel the hardy the hardy wrestling podcast and just anywhere you can listen to stuff like this you can find it and um also check out some of the stuff that we've got going on um for women's wrestling talk where i helped um co-host on that team um you can follow us at ww talk pod on instagram and twitter and visit our website at www.talkpod.com and visit our youtube channel you can watch all of our news and interview stuff there and also you can watch our um women's wrestling talk show every other wednesday um on fight tv so yeah just continue to support wrestling podcasters you know as a whole because we're out here creating great content for you guys to listen to and i hope that you know you just continue to find a safe place you know in my show where you can listen and feel safe to you know with all of your opinions and you can share your opinions under posts that I make and stuff like that so with that in mind I hope you're being your best self and I hope you're being healthy and choosing happiness and I hope that you're being safe because there's still a panorama going on um but in the midst of that I just also hope that you're making your dreams come true and living with no fear so with that in mind this is the hardy wrestling podcast with your girl stephanie hardy signing off bye y'all